Where's the clicker? Is there a clicker? Who is that clicker? Who's running off with the clicker? It is not mine. Oh, hey, have you got the clicker? Do you still have the clicker? The For the slideshow. Okay. Oh, here, here. <laughs> it's my first time up here. I don't That's know these things. Right. Hey guys, my name is William Ackley. I go by Bill. Don't even dare. <laughs> I'm a licensed captain and for the last about 15 years, I've been running supply vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. Both that I'm assigned to you right now is 280 foot by 60 foot wide. And every day we have to go through safety protocol to ensure the safety of our personnel. Do you guys have standing protocols for yourself? How many people work with multiple people? Okay, so the, we've got like one or two. How many times when you get out of your car, do you take a look around? Stop, from, stop long enough to say, hey, what's going on in this yard? I can't hear you, speak up please. It doesn't mean that you can't be, though. Now, there's, there's a reason why I'm speaking about this, and I'm going to get to it here shortly. But when you get out of your car, even before you get into your car, you pull on the parking lot. There's a lot of yards that have a parking lot and then the area in which you're going to be doing your survey. And then there's other places in which you're pulling up next to the boat you're surveying, right? Go like this if you're still with me, go like this, no? Okay. Now, we work in environments where they have travel lifts moving back and forth daily. We have forklifts with boats on them with limited line of sight for the individual driving them. We've got hazards all around us. We collectively, as an organization, need to promote our safety. And hopefully this is, will help you in doing this and just assessing how safe is your work area. So, okay, that's not working. Okay, there's only two buttons I can push and I messed it up. What's the down button? Down button. Okay, you figure it out. Okay, it's a round button. Anyway. <laughs> How can I mess it up from over here? Okay, what do I push? The down button goes forward. This the one. Down arrow. Okay. Oh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is PPE, personal pr protective equipment. If anything's misspelled, don't tell me. I don't care. Actually, I do, it'd be like a survey. But anyway, your PPE in some areas, If how many people work in shipyards? Okay. Well, I do not adva advancing again. That I can't help. No, I don't know. It's just the fault of the system today. We can't rectify it. Sorry, guys, I can't rectify it. I just don't know what's, what's making it happen. I'll do some work overnight and try and sort it out for tomorrow. Now, when I say PPE, it's basically things you put on to protect yourself through the environmental or through the environment in which you're walking through. We're going to start off with our hard hats. It used to be hard hats, well, besides the color, used to come in that shape. But now they come in different sizes, different shapes, different colors. This ball, ball cap looking type are actually bump caps used by engineers in the engine room or in engineering. So this way, when they're walking around and don't realize there's a pipe overhead, they won't hit their head on it. 
We used to have a technician that would come down with a ball cap. And it's like, you want your bump cap? No, oh, no, don't need that. Well, he went down below one day. He didn't come up for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. We didn't really miss him because we were doing other things. He came back upstairs, kind of looking perplexed. It's like, what happened? What's wrong? He's got this big red mark across his head. He said he was walking with a bill forward. And when he walked underneath that one pipe, he didn't see. That knocked him out, literally. If he had taken the time, if nothing else, just to turn the hat around, it would have saved him from having a massive headache and a bunch of people laughing at him. If he were to have worn the bump hat, it would have helped him protect his forehead. Now, in most yards, these are, you know, your basic hard hat is the required standard. You get out of your vehicle, it better be on. The only time that you're not going to be using a hard hat is if you go inside. And go inside to do something in the office, work in some kind of equipment, things of that nature. But if you're out walking about, they want your hard hat. Please. So I was just going to share with you, I don't know, if he actually knocked himself out, which I have done, unfortunately, so I know what that's like. But um, with all of the concern about concussions and everything today, we, we actually filled out a report. The our policy is that if somebody goes unconscious without them trying to, they're not taking a nap or something. If they go unconscious because they hit their head or they have a seizure or something like that, our safety policy is that they go to the hospital. What we did was we notified, there was a direct line of communication to the office. Hey, this happened. Paramedics came down, they monitored him, they said, we want to take you to the hospital. He said, no, I refuse. And that's all he had to do was say, I refuse. I don't need to go. That's true. But the, the point I was trying to make for the rest of the people here is that a lot of people do not understand that if somebody goes unconscious, that is like 911 call. You need to, they can refuse later and everything, but from, a, from an employer standpoint or from a first aider standpoint, even if you revive them, you need to get professional help. That is correct. And again, this is going back quite a few years. The safety protocols in the oil field today are much, much, much better and proactive than they were, say, 15, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, it was like, if you're not going to do it, we're going to get somebody else in here. Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. They, they, they are... Everything you, everything you see up here. Well, you got your straps on here. Ba basically, the bump cap. What you're, what you're describing, the there is a headband that goes around, and you have an air pocket between this part and the band, which holds your head on. Now, this part right here does the same thing, but it's tighter parameters. It is called a bump cap because it's not designed as a hard hat. Do you see this one? No, I, I understand, but do you see this? This is the same innards as this one would have. Okay. Okay. Uh, again, you, every, everything I'm showing you is, is OSHA approved, so on and so forth, has all the testing done. And, you know, you can't look stylish in the cowboy outfit over here, too. Okay, your basic safety glasses. You have your normal glasses. They have the side protection. People go, well, I wear glasses all the time. They don't have the side pieces if they're not made of plastic because some eyeglasses are glass. They may be shatter resistant, but they can, still can shatter and put glass in your eyes. That's why you want something like this. When I was growing up, this is all that we got. Now you have face shields that look um, kind of interesting. 
basic gloves. Gloves are gloves, wrong. These gloves right down here, these are rigorous gloves. If you take a look at it, you've got these, the fingers, but they're padded on the outside. Because what, what riggers do is they work with items that are being hooked up to a crane, taken from, in my case, taken from the boat to the rig or vice versa. So their hands are constantly hitting metal upon metal. So these gloves have to be very, very tough. Then you have the mechanics gloves. You guys have all worn these. These are awesome. It's almost like you're wearing nothing because they're so flexible and they almost act like your skin. Unlike these, which I could barely get my hands in, but the leather and fabric backing, again, they do different things. Different gloves for different jobs. Then you have your, your um, rubberized palms. So when you're working with any kind of wet, um, a wet environment, if you will, the palms will stay dry. When your hands will sweat, it'll be wicking up through the fabric on the back. Again, there's a lot of sciences that go through what we take for granted. <coughs> Steel toe shoes have come a long, long way. Again, when I was growing up, basically you'd have something like this. Now you can be fashionable and, and patriotic if you wanted a nice little slip on. I wear shoes similar to this simply because I, I know if I go into the water, I can kick them off and I can swim. Boots like these big ones are rather hard if you, if you find yourself in the water. You got a sneaker type. You got a complete rubber. Boot, waterproof, steel toe, great for almost any environment. They smell pretty good after a hot day's work. <laughs> work vest. We all work around the water. How many people use a work vest when you're out doing te testing your boats? Okay, we have a handful. Smart move, everybody else buy one. I put these up because it is mandatory for us to wear them. Now, I'm a fat guy, I mean, not a large guy. <laughs> and I put the buoyancies so you can understand the different things. This vinyl dip type five is great. You know, it will never deflate. The problem is you've got this solid piece against your body in the back and the front and your body can't breathe. And when you're working out in 110, 115 degree heat, it's making you drink a lot of water. It only provides 17.5 pounds of buoyancy. And then you have the vest style. It's a lot more comfortable than your vinyl dip, but it still only provides 15.5. Then we come to the inflatable. Inflatable vests are wonderful. This is what I wear at work. This is what our company decided. They're about 200 and some odd dollars a piece. They are not cheap. They are a one-time use because the CO2 cartridge inside here is integrated into the inflatable part. So as protocol for our company, we, every quarter, for a safety drill, we open these things up, we roll them out to make sure that everything is functional. What I mean by this, you've got a pull tab down here, make sure that is not cut or compromised, so if you do tug it, it will actually set itself off. I used to work for one company and they had a, what's known in the industry as a gunboat. A gunboat has an array of cannons, if you will, air cannons, facing down. It's a seismic boat. They're looking for oil and or gas. And this boat cannot stop. It does not go to port. And if it does, it takes them about two days to get all the equipment in. So the way they do crew changes, 
is they bring another boat while they're going alongside or while they're running this other boat comes alongside they take the oncoming crew put them on take the offcoming crew put them on just swap the crews it works wonderfully it's one gentleman that was getting off ready to see his family he's sitting on the side or the gunnel of this boat this tender boat and as he pulls away the tender pulls away he cuts it too hard he pulled out and then cut back into the boat hits the gunboat slams back into the gunboat unfortunately he rolls over and goes underneath the boat never to be seen again guys safety safety if you're next to a boat like this if you're working boats that have low gunnels this gunnel is about this tall it's just in the wrong place at the wrong time we got slips everybody understands slips trips and falls this is slip wet oily surfaces can cause one to lose footing and slip we've all seen this after a rain you've all seen what well, we spoke about um non-skid today we got a freshly painted deck that has no non-skid it sprinkles there's no signs up just a little quick sun shower somebody comes walking across that deck it's slick and boom in our industry we say you've got to be situational situationally aware meaning you need to know what's all the way around you, 360 degrees, that'd be top and bottom and all the way around. Because if you don't, you can get yourself hurt. Trips, basically a result from, could be poor housekeeping, uneven surfaces, broken items or broken um, walkways, non-finished walkways that are improperly marked. Let's say these guys just went off to lunch and said, ah, we'll finish this up after lunch. It doesn't help the people that are walking around the area that don't realize it's being worked on. If you're in a situation in which you're doing work like this, make sure you cordon it off to prevent this. Be proactive, be a pain in the ass because it is your responsibility first off to take care of yourself and it is your responsibility to tag the people who should be taking care of everybody else make sure they're doing it falls falls calls resulting from a slip or trip makes sense i slip on something sand gravel an extension cord a friend of mine not too long ago was surveying a vessel. Where's your focus? I am looking here. I'm moving around. I'm trying to get the best view I possibly can. I didn't realize that there was an extension cord down here. The young man fell, created a head injury or head wound, and had to go to the hospital. It sucks when you're trying to survey a boat from the hospital, right? Be aware of what you're walking around on. Common causes for slips, trips, and falls. You got four states. Rushing, frustration, fatigue, and complacency. What's the old saying about complacency? It kills. Sometimes we just get so frustrated. We're doing the same thing over and over and over and over. We've done this a hundred times. Nothing's ever happened. Well, here comes 101 and you haven't been vigilant on your safety protocols. It's like how many guys have you, how many times have you climbed underneath the boat and it wasn't properly locked? Meaning there wasn't a chain between two stanchions. <coughs> Two supports. <laughs> what are chains? 
What are chains? What are sports? Okay. I walked into that one. That was good. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, this is where you get kind of annoyed at the yard because you're here to do a job. The boat was supposed to be out of the water, blocked, ready for you to climb underneath and do your job. Are you going to climb underneath the two or three of the boat jacks or not where they're supposed to be, not properly chained up? I know I don't. I'd be like a big bug. Anyway. Now for us, we do, for us meaning in our industry, we do what's known as the JSEA, Job Safety Environmental Impact Assessment or Analysis. And basically what that is, I'm going to tell you what I feel it is. It's basically our insurance companies forcing us to be compliant of having a job plan before we start it. Not a bad thing, is it? It's like, okay, what do I need? Well, what job are we doing? Boom, put it on a piece of paper. Basic st job steps. What am I doing? Well, let's say we're needle gunning, buffing, and grinding. Our deckhands will get out and start writing that. And there's certain protocols, it's like assemble the proper tools. Without the proper tools, you can't do the job, so you might as well not start it. What kind of additional PPE will you need? Well, in grinding out in the oil field, not only do you need your, your eyewear, you also need a face shield because that little wire brush that's spinning around at the end of a grinder has a tendency of spinning out metal parts. How many people have used a wire brush on a grinder? Okay, how many people here have gotten those little wire in, in your skin, they are so awesome. This is why you go the extra step to protect your face, more specifically your eyes. Anybody heard of lockout, tag out? Okay, for those of us who don't or haven't heard of it, lockout, tag out is something, it's a protocol. Say I'm working on this light fixture. I've got to change the ballast out in it. Brings me to another story, but hang on. To ensure that I don't get electrocuted, I want to make sure I go over and I turn off the switch. Well, I need to do something beyond that. I'm going to go to the breaker box and I'm going to, going to turn that breaker off so even if someone pops this light switch on, it can't come on or energize while I'm working on there. And let's just say that this electrical box and that breaker have the ability to put a lock on it, a physical lock. This lock only has one key, so please don't lose it. And what that does is, I should say, and on that lock, it has locked out by in this case, it would be William Ackley. On this date, at this time, to service this life. So anybody who goes, yes, sir? Uh, go ahead and finish your, uh, your, your couple pictures. I gotta remember where I am now. <laughs> so while you're working on the light, it can't come back on. Whoever's in the electrical box can't inadvertently turn it on and you get shocked. That's what lockout is. Okay, um, I will go one step further, actually two steps further. Lock too often you only think about lockout as electrical. Pressure system, pressurized system, fuel oil, hydraulics, those are lockout tags. Did you read this? No. I, I'm just wondering because I'm going to be covering this, okay. but he's 100% correct. What else are you missing? Uh, you have compressed air, Okay, some areas of what you're talking about. Let me get to my story first, then I'll get into the pressurized systems, the hydraulics, 
and the store to energies. I was working at Volvo, and that was my first job when I was 18, <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> and during the summer months, I was their yacht captain, and during the winter months, they kept me employed because I needed money. So I would work as maintenance. Absolutely no training and no thought of safety. It was not a culture back there. We didn't think about safety. It's just like, ah, go out and do it. So the light needed to be changed in the office. And we couldn't lock it out, couldn't tag it out, because everybody in the office had to see while they were working. I had to change the ballast. So I was shown, here, this is how you do it. Just don't ground yourself. So I get the ladder, I set it up, pull the light fixture down. I get up there and I'm fixing, and you know, I got the wire nuts off, I'm spreading the wires, then all of a sudden, all I know is I'm going, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long, felt like three hours that I was standing up there, but I finally freed myself with a slight grunt, and I look around, first off for smoke, and second of all, to see if anybody saw what I did. <laughs> it felt like someone had beat me through my arms because of the electrical current. Short story long, lock it out, tag it out, don't hurt yourself. Now we're talking about stored energies. What's your name? George. George, that George brought up. Storage energy in Air systems and hydraulic systems are not uncommon. On the boats we run, we have hydraulic safety equipment. So if in the event that our compressors or the, the pressure producing devices go down because no electricity, they will swing the emergency equipment out. They have enough oomph to go so you can drop your rescue vessel FRC in this case. Your air systems, like for your pneumatic starts, for your engines, things to that nature, may have more than just one air receiver. And with those air receivers, they could be stored either right next to the air compressors or in a separate room. So if you're working on these systems, you need to make sure that this system is completely void of being able to regenerate power or pressure. Because if you have to take or break open the system and there's residual pressure, you could deglove a finger, a hand, rip your arm off, or basically kill yourself. Again, you gotta think beyond now. Yep. And you can die from that. There used to be any, do we have any other sailors in the group? Okay. I meant commercial sailors. We had a, I was working with a guy that was an engineer on a steam plant. Steam uses pressure to make things work like your turbines. And they had a pressure leak. They had a new guy and the old guy. And they were told, go find it. And the kid's about ready to run, and the old guy went, come here, boy, let me show you something. Goes out, and he picks up a two-by-four, and the kid goes, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, watch this. And he was going like this. And then when he went like this, and the tip of that two-by-four dropped on the ground, he found the leak. Couldn't see it, couldn't hear it. 
they had to isolate the thing, fix it, and they moved on. <laughs> Same thing, right? When the steam cuts the 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 item apart, it's that's where it is. Okay, confined space. It's large enough for an employee to enter. Or, let's see, it's large enough for an employee to enter and perform assigned work. It is not designed for continuous occupancy by an employee. It has limited or restricted means of entry or exit. These spaces may include underground vaults, tanks, storage bins, pits. Do you guys get into any kind of? Chain lockers, big one. Every day you guys climb into a boat, don't you? And your assumption is it's ready to go into. Do you guys have a atmosphere? There was a couple that had an aluminum vessel. They had it all nice and closed up for the winter. It's about springtime. They're about ready to go in. Let's go and get the boat ready. They go down to the main salon, take two breaths, and both of them are dead. Drop them like that. It's in a commons area in which it doesn't fit any of this. It was designed for a livable space without any entry permits. And they just died. I said it was an aluminum boat. During the winter, conditions were right. Condensation on the hull inside. It started to um, corrode, basically. Took the oxygen out of the space. And with them taking or just entering from the, the protection for the winter, the winter cover, and walking out of the main salon, they didn't leave the door open long enough. They didn't test the atmosphere, and they dropped dead doing something they really enjoy doing. How wonderful. Think about what it is you guys are doing. How long has the boat been open before you climb into it? How many times have they said, well, we just got it. It's just been uncovered yesterday. What's the first thing they normally do if they uncover a boat? They normally what, plug it in to shore power, get those batteries um, charging if they haven't taken the batteries off. What does, what is a charging battery? Um, now hydrogen sulfide is my next topic. Hydrogen, it's explosive, it's not air, and you'll die. And you're crawling into a space that has a known pollutant to you. Hydrogen sulfide, H2S, also is in that area. It's in the holding tank. If they have not, if the owners have not pumped the poop tank, what happens? If it's not properly vented, or in this case, if the ventilation have been covered and there's no means of passing air through, you're walking into a possible hazardous environment. Before you go down, check the blower. I have a story about a vacuum flush system. So if you want to meet me at the bar, I'll tell you about that. And, and that man sitting over there knows exactly what I'm going to talk about. Anyway, now with confined spaces, since they are a critical place and can cause bodily harm, we have certain things, protocols, 
that OSHA requires. Well, let you guys take a second and read this. Well, that's all right. I can't read it up here either. <laughs> I've been having problems with my eyes. They're just aging too fast. Anyway, basically what it says is you need to have an entry program. The company needs to have an entry program for you to enter a space. The space has to be inspected normally by a marine chemist. The chemist comes down and he measures the air. If you have a marine chemist come down and inspect a space that you're going to be getting into, make sure his little plastic tube that he's with a sniffer is more than three foot long. I literally saw in Fouchon, Louisiana, Port Fouchon is where I work out of, a guy came in and said, I'm going to sniff this. And I looked at him and I said, no, you'll get a longer tube, one that will actually hit the bottom of the tank, which is almost 20 some odd feet deep. Because if you're only measuring this far from the top of the tank, and you've got another, what, 18 feet down, you don't know what that environment or atmosphere is. You don't know what's in there. You know, what have you been transporting? You could be transporting hazardous chemicals. This is why you need to have these permits, these steps and processes in place before you go in. And if in the event of emergency, part of that protocol has to be, how do you retrieve somebody if they've had an accident? And if you, if you don't have that plan, don't go in. And I'm being serious. Because some of these tanks that you go into, they have a hazardous atmosphere. Let's see, contains material with the potential to engulf someone who enters the space. It's a gas. There's a gas. But it has the ability if you have Say you had gasoline down there. It's not a good environment to breathe. Also, it has, um, let's see. This one, number three, has internal configuration that may, might cause an entrant, that's the person going in, hence entrant, um, to be trapped or asphyxiated by inward curving walls or floor. What the hell does that mean? That means, I, I'm not sure if I can do this. I can fly away. If you have a wall like this, vertical, then you have another wall that comes down, like slope of your bow. Take a cross section, take a look at it. It goes like this. Your entrance point is going to be high on any given tank because that's the least amount of pressure. The lower you go in a tank, the more pressure it has against that opening. So those openings are really high. So the person goes in, missteps, falls down, and gets trapped in this V. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to scare you on that one. That's what that means. Now, entering a space, this is the sources CFR 29, 1910.146 Appendix A. You can get in if you answer all the questions right. And no, I'm not going to go over this. I just want to show you the importance of this. There is a CFR that covers this, the Code of Federal Regulations, that covers this. And if you don't know about this, don't go in the space because you're not ready to go. <laughs> Airborne particulates are aerosol matter. What's an aerosol matter? <coughs> That's big enough to read back there, isn't it? <coughs> an aerosol is a suspension of fine solid partic particulates or liquid droplets in air or other gas. 
How many people have seen sandblasting? Even wet or dry, you're going to have some kind of discharge that's going to hang in the air. Your normal aggregate that you're blasting with has now been atomized along with the objects or the items of what you're trying to remove from the hull. Now, when I said, when I said, when you get out of your car, how many people stop? You look and you listen. You listen for those things you can't immediately see. There may be a guy sandblasting two rows over. It's the wind blowing those fine particulates or aerosols your way. If so, what can we do about it? Why do we care? It's because when you inhale what they're taking off, it could hurt you. I have at least two friends because here's another story. I had a friend of mine that was at a boatyard. The winds were blowing about 40 knots. It hadn't rained for weeks and weeks. And how many people have been in a boatyard where the wind is whipping around the buildings and you got these dust devils? Anybody ever in, in, get in that kind of environment? And you're all shaking your head, yep, sure. Okay, you're just, we're just making sure I'm answering the questions as I go along. It's not good when I'm attacked all at once. Anyway. <laughs> So he's standing there, doesn't think twice. Who does? Now the boatyard's been there for centuries. Okay, a few years, 20, 30 years, 40 years. And it has been the site of multiple sandblasting, multiple grindings. And we're talking about fine particulates that are laying in the soil. And while they're laying in the soil, they are just, they're ammunition waiting to get picked up and inhaled. And unfortunately for my friend, he inhaled. And unfortunately, he got sick for weeks. If he had just in his arsenal, we're talking about toolbox, what we're we gonna add to our toolbox, $2,000 here, $50,000 there, Oh my God, over there. <laughs> now that is the shit, let me tell you. That is an awesome piece of equipment. <laughs> if he had in his arsenal the basic dust mask that may have prevented him from getting sick. I mean, he was violently sick. He was coughing up things I just don't want to describe. Now, there are other means of you got your half face filtered. You got your organic vapor. Your eyes are protected with this one. Again, another half face, again, filtered. They have active charcoal, being able to take fi the fine particulates out of the air, so you're breathing air. What these guys don't do, what these guys don't do, is they don't take gases out of the air. They don't take the lead, excuse me, they don't take the things that can actually kill you like, like gases out of the air. This hood system, and more specifically, this force supply air helps you stay alive if there is a toxic toxin like H2S in the air. The other ones won't, they won't filter it out. <coughs> Oh my good golly, I am done. I am ready for some questions. Okay, no questions, awesome. George, go ahead. Actually, one, one observation, um, this came up a few years ago when I was working for one of the class societies. Um, and our surveyor was doing a lot of voyage surveys underway, on, uh, rafting tanks, things like that. Um, and we actually went so far as to craft a, Basic safety 